now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Crime drama Jay Johnston stars as Mr. District Attorney, an episode going all the way back to June 5th, 1946, and is the case of Baby Cradle and All. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by two famous Bristol Myers products, Vitalis and Sal Hepatica. Vitalis for hair that's well-groomed. Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Vitalis, Sal Hepatica. And it shall be my duty as District Attorney... Not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. The case of Baby, Cradle, and All. Our story opens tonight on the Lancaster estate in the suburb of your district attorney's city. At the front door, Mrs. Lancaster is just getting out of her lawyer's car. Time for a drink, Walter? There'll be ice and things on the terrace. Oh, I can't, Maeve. Got to get back to town. Oh, I wish you'd change your mind. Oh, I can't, really. Hey, isn't that Drew on the terrace? Why, why yes, it is. That's strange. He said he was lunching in town with some friends of his from college. Drew? Oh, Drew, dear. If you ask me, your son's busy. Busy? Who's the girl? <laughs> I don't know. That's what I meant by busy. Well, I'll phone you when I want those tax reports signed, man. Yes, Walter, do. Mother, I... I thought you were in town. And I thought you were. Oh, what a shame. I told Julia there'd be no luncheon. Uh, yeah, she told me. Walter have to leave? Yes. Yeah. He's busy in town. I didn't know you were having a guest. Oh, I'm not. I, I mean, Laurie and I just drove out. She, uh, wanted to see the house. Really, dear, you might have said... Laurie... Lorelei Ross. Lorelei? Uh, come on, I'll introduce you. Ross. I don't remember you ever saying... To wait a minute. Hope I didn't scare Walter away. Oh, mother? Uh, Miss Ross. Laurie, this is my mother. Miss Ross. Swell to meet you, Mrs. Lancaster. Thank you, my dear. Oh, do sit down. Uh, drink, lady? It's rum. Thank you, girl. This, uh... Sure is a beautiful place, Mrs. Lancaster. Just like something in the movies. Uh, I was telling Laurie about your archery, Mother. She got quite a kick out of it. Really? I'd say I did. I never shot a bow and arrow. Never really had to. I do it for exercise, mostly. Oh, yes, I understand. You aren't having lunch with your friends from school, Drew? Uh, no, Mother. No, I'm not. <laughs> it's a shame, Miss Ross. If it weren't so late, I'd insist you stay and have luncheon here with us. Oh, sure, but... As a matter of fact, Mother, we're going back to town. Uh, I'm taking Laurie to a matinee. This afternoon? But, darling, you can't. Oh, but, but I have already... I mean, surely you haven't forgotten Dr. Marks. I made my major appointment myself. He is sick, Drew? Uh, he's a dentist. But that can oh. wait, Mother. You, you can call now, him. Now, isn't help... he terrible, Miss Ross? Honestly, I have to leave him around like a great big baby. Now, Mother, really, there's no reason to Oh, but, Drew, we can do it. It'll be fun. Certainly, Drew. Miss Ross doesn't mind, I'm sure. Oh, of course not. We'll go to your dentist this afternoon and take in the show tonight. But I... Oh, I can get off at the barbershop all right, Drew, and then we can eat together and everything. Oh, that sounds swell, Laurie. But you don't understand. Oh, sure I do, Mrs. Lancaster. I know Drew pretty well, too. You do? Like you say, you've got to lead him around like a big kid. <laughs> Golly, don't I know. This is the complete file on the girl, Mr. District Attorney. Mm -hmm. I had my trustee collect everything he could get. Mm, I see. Uh, take this, will you please, Miss Miller? Right, Chief. 
Uh, the girl's name is Ross, Mrs. Lancaster. Lorelei Ross. Lorelei. She's apparently called Laurie. A manicurist, you said, Mrs. Lancaster, huh? It's all there in the report, Mr. Harrington. Yes, My son met the girl in this barber shop. Mm, I see. And after you met her, you had your trustee investigator, is that right? Walter Lambert, yes. Mm -hmm. He's been my trustee for years. Ever since my husband died, he's handled everything for me. Mm. Oh, you'll find the information accurate, all right. Well, yes, I don't question that, Mrs. Lancaster. But, uh, frankly, I'm not exactly clear on what you expect us to do. Do? Yes. Why, it's the most obvious thing I ever saw. Mm. This manicurist is deliberately trying to marry my son. Oh, first do, huh? I beg your pardon? Well, oh, well we've got to be practical, Mrs. Lancaster. <laughs> Everybody in town knows your son comes into $8 million pretty soon now. Exactly. Yeah, sure. Well, I remember seeing his picture when he got turned down by his draft board. Drew always had publicity, no matter how I tried to avoid it. Yes, well, I don't think you quite understand, Mrs. Lancaster. If you find this girl undesirable as an associate for your son... Well, that's a matter for you and the boy. But I... As for any action against the girl, well, there's no complaint. She's committed no crime, Mrs. Lancaster. You admit that yourself. You don't think it's a crime to marry my boy for his money? Uh, Mrs. Lancaster. <laughs> yes? I'm sorry, Chief. Well, it's all I'm right. Not... Go right ahead, Miss Lancaster. Well, I just wonder if you're giving this girl a break, Mrs. Lancaster. Have you talked to her? Maybe she loves your son. Maybe he loves her. After all, we... I see. I see. It, it, well, I sure don't. I've created the wrong impression here, haven't I? Oh, be honest. To you, I seem one of those awful society mothers. Nothing's good enough for my boy, that sort of thing. Well, this does strike me as unusual, Mrs. Lancaster. As Miss Miller has just pointed out... Well, I'm not, you see. I'm not at all. Hmm. I know this girl, and I know her game. Her game? Yes. I know this girl because I was this girl myself. Huh? Yes, it's true. I hooked Drew's father just exactly the way this kid's trying to hook him. Yeah, no kid. Well, I'm sorry. But and I'm, I'm ashamed of it. Oh, not to tell you. I'm not ashamed to admit it to the whole world. But I am ashamed to let it happen to my son. And believe me, it won't. Oh, calm down, May. I've nothing but Sherry here in the office. Would you care for some? Calm down? Walter, do you realize what this girl is trying to do? Yes, her record's pretty obvious, isn't it? No family to speak of, batted around from one town to another. Quite a record with the police in Norfolk, apparently. Walter, she's got her hands on Drew. And what does he say? Oh, he won't even discuss it. He thinks she loves him. You pointed out to him that under the terms of his father's will, you turn over the trust to him in August? Of course. And he still thinks this Lorelei Ross isn't after his money. Her record and his trust... He can't add that up, hmm? Would I have gone to the district attorney if he could? Now, May, dear. Yes? I've handled things for you for a long time. I wish you'd let me handle this Ross matter as well. But there's no question of you handling it, Walter. I'm sorry you went to the DA. I know, I know. But when he defied me again this morning, when he walked out of the house to see her again, I just didn't know what to do. Well, I do, May. From now on, let me handle this in my own way. Anything, Walter. Anything you want. First, I think I want you to call the DA. Call him. There's the phone. Call him and tell him to forget the entire incident. But I... I know what I'm doing, May. Call him, please. Now. Yes, I understand, Mrs. Lancaster. Yeah. Yes, yes, I think that's wise of you. Well, these things often work themselves out. Yes, of course. No, no trouble at all. Thank you. Now what, Chief? Does she want the girl put on bread and water? Oh, well, as a matter of fact, Miss Miller, Mrs. Lancaster has changed her mind. What? Yes, yeah, she's decided to do nothing, Harrington. Uh, well, what do you know about that? I know this about it, Miss Miller. She had that Ross girl pegged pretty good. Oh? Yeah, Chief, I uh, did a little checking up during the noon hour. Mm -hmm. This Laurie Ross has been bragging all over town about how she's hooked a millionaire kid. Oh, no. Well, from what I saw, Mrs. Lancaster, I'd say the girl has her work cut out for her. <laughs> you can say that again, Chief. Just like she said in the office, she knows that game herself. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll admit I did admire her for saying it. Most women wouldn't. Well, Chief, I guess uh, we can forget about this one, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I'd be perfectly happy to forget about it, but there's one thing I can't forget. Yeah, what's that, Chief? Eight million dollars, Harrington. Sometimes that means trouble. You 
want the cuticle push back, mister? I always ask for some men don't like it. Oh, that's fine. Thank you, Laurie. Just the way they are. I'll just finish up now. And... Say, how'd you know my name? One of the barbers tell you? No, I've never been in this barber shop before. That's what I was thinking. My name is Lambert, Laurie. Walter Lambert. I'm trustee for the Drew Lancaster estate. Oh, you are. Well, you listen to don't me. Don't get excited, Laurie. Go on, finish my nails. We can talk here as well as any place. You can take your fingernails. Don't be foolish, Laurie. You don't want to lose your job here, do you? Listen, when I get through with Drew Lancaster, he and I'll be like that, see? This job. Your old man's mustache, Mr. Wise Guy. Going to marry him, Laurie? You're darn right I'm going to marry him. He loves me. And what do you love, kid? Drew or his eight million bucks? None of your... Now, listen here. Keep your voice down. Without me, you haven't got a chance. Did you ever hear of a frame, kid? Did you ever hear of even innocent little girls getting framed right out of town? Why, you dirty... Remember Norfolk, Laurie? Ever lie to the probation officer down there? Ever think he might like to hear from you, Laurie? Norfolk. Uh Uh-huh. I know a lot about you. Wait a minute. Let me peg this. You handle the dough, huh? Why, sure. You got Mama hogtied, and in August, all that scratch goes to the kid. You're getting very smart, Laurie. And if Mama loses, so do you. Right? Right. Now I'll talk. I can have you out of town in one hour, kid. And you know I can do it. Talk some more. But if we team up, if we handle this my way, we both get rich. Eight million rich? Oh, uh, that's the neighborhood, Laurie. How'd you like to live there? I see what you mean, mister. June 5th, 1946, Mr. District Attorney on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You ever make a change and then think, why didn't I do this years ago? Well, that's how people feel about switching to MediShare for their health care, especially now with inflation the way it is. People are very happy with the savings. Most families save about $500 a month when they switch. It's a huge help when prices are going up so fast in so many other areas. And MediShare's customer satisfaction rate is double that of health insurance. It's just a different experience, and people really like that. MediShare is an alternative to health insurance. It's a community of Christians who share each other's health care bills, and it's been going strong for over 25 years. It really is the gold standard, the most trusted name in health care sharing. Find out why people love it. Find out why they rave about the customer service and find out how good it feels to save some money right now. They're super easy to talk to. Here's the number. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of Mr. District Attorney, June 5th, 1946. Good morning, Drew. Is Mother with you, Walter? Why, no. Isn't she here? Here? She got your phone call about an hour ago. She went right into town. My phone call? Oh, but that's impossible. I was on my way out here. Oh, you drive? I didn't hear your car. I parked it down on the highway and walked across the lawn. My only chance for exercise these days, I'm afraid. I didn't know you went in for archery too, Drew. Our mother's the expert. I was just fooling around. Here, you want to try? Oh, no, thanks. I don't need that much exercise. You're sure May went into town to see me? Hmm? Well, you know, Mother, she's always getting things mixed up. Uh, there's a bottle and some mix on that bench, Walter. Want to drink? Why, yes, I think I do. I'll get it, Drew. Yeah, help yourself. Huh? Good shot. Mix you one? Please. Have you seen much of Miss Ross lately? Don't start on it, Walter. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's your drink. Thanks. Here's to... Miss Ross. Don't be coy, Walter. It doesn't suit you. You don't really believe I'm for you, do you, Drew? Any reason why I should? I know all about you, Walter. In the matter of Miss Ross, for instance. Maze told me how you feel. <clears throat> Mother's always told you so much, Walter. That's been one of the mistakes. Oh, now that's a little harsh, isn't it? After all, I've kept your trust fund intact for you. Uh-huh. Your mother's lived entirely on the income. Who are you kidding? Would you like another drink? I don't know. No, thanks. That one seems to have hit me. Oh, the sun, probably. It is hot out here. Uh, 
think I'll sit down. When you say handling the money was my job, Drew, you infer now, that look, I... look, Walter, if this is a plea, forget it. I'll be 21 soon, and when I am, I'll handle my own affairs. I see. Then you won't retain me, hmm? Never bothered to spare your feelings before, Walter. Why should I begin now? I, I think you're a crook. Oh, you're frank, Drew. I like you for that. Always frank. Very frank. Why, what's the matter? Aren't you feeling well, son? Uh, I'll be all right in a minute. Archery is too much for you, probably. It takes quite an arm to bend this bow. Mind if I try? Not so much. It's, it's easy. <laughs> Look at me. I can hardly pull this thing back. Funny, I, I feel so sick. You put I... the arrow in like this, don't you? Oh, I, I gotta lie down a minute, Walter. I'm dizzy. Put the arrow along the bow like this, don't you? Now, be careful how you point it. Hey, look out. Don't don't point that thing at me. I'll be careful, Drew. It's quite a pull, isn't it? Uh, there's nothing to it. What did you say, Drew? I, I, I said that there's nothing to it. Walla! the reporters, Chief? They want a statement on your raid at the Five Juices Club. Yes, well, I'll be with them as soon as I can. All morning. right. Did you put that gang through the lineup, Harrington? Yeah, all of them, Chief. The head waiter, the four guys we got running the tables, everybody. Yes, and? Well, it proves we were right on one count, Chief. Nobody wanted them, so they must be from out of town. Get circulars out on all of them, would you please, Mr. Yes, sir. They're being prepared now. Well, I hope it's a good sign, Chief. The first joint on the list being a gambling outfit. Oh, I think our list is all right. What bothers me is the real head of it. These men we took in last night are obviously just employees. Yeah, that's right. I pegged that bum Parsons that way. The name Joe Parsons may be on the liquor license, but he sure don't own the place. Yes, exactly. Well, there's nothing to do but work down the list, then. We'll stage another raid tonight. I'll get a control sheet ready, Chief. Yes, please, Miss Pennington. Now, anything else, Harrington? What? Oh, there's a dame showed up in the morgue this morning. Homicide. Oh, I meant to go down. Any story yet? No, I'm working on it. She was dumped out of a car out in the suburbs. Shot once through the back of the head. Yes, I saw the examiner's report. Oh, there's lots of leads to go on, Chief. Fully dressed, handbag full of stuff. I'll know something in a couple of hours. All right, keep me informed, will you? Right. And stand by for tonight. We'll keep on raiding until we find the man we want. Uh, Betsy was a good kid, Walt. Oh, it's too bad. Look here, Jim, you've got to settle down to work. Have you any idea what last night's raid on the five deuces cost me? Well, she was just jealous. You can't blame her for that. Oh, stop it. This is big time. Losing that club will set me back $60,000 at least. Yes, and losing Parsons doesn't help matters. You're going to let him take a fall? Parsons was paid to take this, and at least he did his job. Meaning I'm not. Well, what about her? Has she said anything? Oh, I told you. She just doesn't talk about the DA. I wonder if she could be wise. I don't see how. Oh, she doesn't make a phony move all the time I'm with her. You're not followed. Anything like that? I'm not that dumb, Walt. I could spot a tail a mile away. We can't waste time any longer, Jim. Miller knows what clubs the DA intends to raid, and I must get that list. <laughs> not from little clam up, you won't. Um, when's your next date? Tonight. I paid one of the hairdressing kids five bucks to tell me your favorite movie star. <laughs> so we're going to the movies. All right. Now, listen to what I want you to do, Jim. It occurs to me now, perhaps we've been... Well, let's just say too gentle. I don't see why you don't like him, Harrington. You haven't even met the man. I suppose he's a big shot in the stock market. Mr. Hubbard? Mm. Oh, I'd hardly say that. Well, you were just telling me he talks about the market all the time. Oh, Harrington, honestly. No, 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 Miss Miller, tell me more. Now, when you go to the Emerald Room, the head waiters all jump up at once. Huh? Now, what else? I didn't say that. And what, what, oh, yeah, yeah, they bring a phone to his table. Boy, what a man of distinction. That's better than bringing you a bowl of pretzels at the Dutchman's. Yeah. For your information, Brenda, the Dutchman serves peanuts. Oh, why don't you stop? You haven't even met him. Please give him... Oh, 
Sorry I'm late. Hi, hi, Any Chief. Any calls, Miss Miller? Uh, they're on your desk, Chief. Oh. oh, and your Christmas deals came. Good. Remind me to send a check tomorrow. Yes, sir. Harrington and I bought ours at noon. Yeah. Oh, that's something we never forget, those Christmas deals. Right. Oh, Chief, I got most of the story on that girl, the homicide in the morgue. Oh. Her name's Mitzi Page. Cased her apartment this afternoon. I see. Anything promising? Well, nothing much from the neighbors. Oh, there's a boyfriend in it, I think. I took his picture off her dresser. Wait a second, I got it right here. Now, that manila envelope, Harrington? Yeah. It's right here. Oh, open it, will you please, Miss Miller? Sure. Looks like a newcomer, Chief. Well, LC's just straight. That one, Miss yeah, Miller? Yeah, I'll have it copied for you. Oh. Oh, no. What's the matter? Harrington, this, this picture, this was on the dead girl's dresser? Yeah, sure it was. Why? Yeah, something the matter, Miss Miller? Well, Chief, this, this man, this is... Jim Hubbard. Who? Why, I can't... Jim Hubbard, Harrington, you... my friend, the man I... Why, why I've got a date with him tonight. Hey, wait well... a minute, wait a minute. This man, this is the one you met at the charity bazaar? Why, I don't understand it, Chief. It, it, it's the same man. Mm. It, it doesn't make sense. Oh, brother, this is something new. Miss Miller. I'm shocked. Uh, well, I mean, surely there's some explanation. Surely... Well, now, wait a minute. Let's not be too well, hasty. I, I know, Suppose but... we just talk about this man a little. If you are willing, tell us just what you already know. From June 5th, 1946, Mr. District Attorney on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets? It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call you'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us? We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, call right now to learn more about your risk-free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk-free offer. 800-738-5332. 800-738-5332. That's 800-738-5332. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get pain magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Mr. District Attorney, the case of Baby Cradle and All, June 5th, 1946. Honestly, Jim, this is one of the craziest nights I've ever spent. I told you I had a surprise. Oh, my friend's upstairs. He'll be down in a minute. (laughs) You are unpredictable. Oh? First we go to the Robert Montgomery picture, and after five minutes you want to leave. Oh, I'm funny that way. If I can't get interested, I walk out. Gee, we we sure did. And then this uh, long ride out here. A friend of yours lives here, you said? Yes, you'll like him. May I intrude? Oh, come in, Walt. We were waiting for you. Miss Miller? This is Walt. How do you do? Pleasure, Miss Miller. I had your car put around in bag, Jim, all right? Sure, sure, Walt. That's fine. <laughs> we won't be leaving. We won't? Oh, well, my goodness. I ought to leave right now. I'm a working girl, you know. I have to get up in the morning. Yeah, 
Yes, Jim's told me of your work, Miss Miller. Oh? Does the district attorney always have one of his men follow you in the evening? Follow me? <laughs> well, I don't know what you mean. Sure you do, Ken. Tonight. I must say he was easily lost, Miss Miller. Jim tells me you merely went into the movie theater by one door, left by another, and your shadow was gone. Now, really, I don't think this is very funny at all. Why would anyone follow me? I'll be happy to explain, Miss Miller. No, don't get up, please. <laughs> Because you're going to talk, little lady. <laughs> and you're going to start right now. No, never mind. But tell him I want to see him the first thing in the morning. Right. Yes, and keep this line clear. I don't get it, Chief. You told Miss Miller to phone in by ten. It's after midnight. And I'm beginning to get it, Carrington. Hubbard knew he was being followed. Don't tell me... Oh, yes, geez. Brophy followed them to a movie theater and he lost them shortly after they went in. Lost? Oh, I know it. I should have gone. I know it. Oh, it's not your fault. It's mine. But I certainly didn't think he'd expect to be shadowed. Yeah, she was supposed to call in by ten. Yes, I know, I know. Harrington, where in the world has he taken that girl? I don't know anything. I don't. You're his secretary. I don't know anything. Oh, please, please stop Jim, it. I yes, don't boss. know anything. Look in that humidor on the desk. I want some cigars. cigars. Yes, cigars. Whole handful. Sure, sure, boss. Whatever you say. <laughs> ever get burnt, Miss Miller? What? Anybody ever put out a cigar in that pretty face of yours? You, you, you're crazy. I tell you, I don't know anything. Except the list uh, of gambling places, huh? Nothing but that list. I never heard of the list. Believe me. There you are, Walt. Light one. <laughs> Oh, well, I'll light it. Sure, please. sure, Walt, right away. Please, won't you understand? I don't... Here, give it to me. Wait a second, William. i got to get it going. No. Press, Miss Miller. Rather no. tell me what places are on that list, would you? I don't know. Hurry, Jim. No, it's okay now, I guess. No, no. Here, thanks. Please don't. See the end, Miss Miller. No. See how it glows? I don't know. I tell you, I don't know. I don't know. What? Who the... Oh, oh, you boys Miller. take too long to oh, find the ice cream. Miss Miller. Don't move a muscle, sweetheart, because, brother, how right. I'd like to take a shot at you. Are you sure you're all right, Miss Miller? Yes. Now, wait a minute. Now, quiet. Okay, Chief. Okay, Harrington, let's take this pair away. your district attorney. I'd like to point out, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, that a gun found in Walter Montello's possession proved to be the weapon used against Mitzi Page, and that, confronted with this evidence, he made a full confession of the murder. Yeah, and his slick stooge, Chief. Yes, and Jim Hubbard, Harrington. And, of course, as a result of their arrest, we were successful in closing all of the gambling establishments he'd set up in the county. Gosh, Chief, I still feel terrible about it. To think I went out with that okay, man. Well, you're hardly to blame, Miss Mitter. Walter Montello was unusually clever. In fact, he made a study of you just to get Jim Hubbard into your good graces. You can have those graces. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Miss Miller. Oh, hey, Chief, why don't you explain just how we knew where they took her? Well, that was a chance we had to take, Harrington. When we realized you were gone, Miss Miller, Harrington and I tried to remember every word you'd said about Jim Hubbard. That's right. And I remembered you said he used a telephone at this nightclub. Yeah. That's right, at the Emerald Room. Exactly. Fortunately, switchboard operators in hotels and nightclubs make a record of outgoing calls. It was fortunate, too, that they'd kept a record of Jim's call to Columbia 5027. Right, because when you trace that number, it's Walt's house. And that's where we found you. Gee, am I glad you did. <laughs> Gee, what about next week? Well, ladies and gentlemen, for next week, we have another story in our continuous war against the underworld, a story of great dramatic excitement. It's the case of Death on Wax, and I invite you to join us for it. So until then, thank you, and good night. The names of all characters in a night's dramatization are fictitious, and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington, and Vicki Bola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden. The program is produced and directed by Edward A. Byram and written by Robert Shaw. 
Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Remember Vitalis for hair that's well-groomed. Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Bristol Myers, makers of Sal Hepatica and Vitalis, invite you to tune in again next Wednesday for Duffy's Tavern and Mr. District Attorney. June 5th, 1946, Mr. District Attorney on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Radio? Why should I advertise on radio? There's nothing to look at, no pictures. Listen, you can do things on radio you couldn't possibly do on TV. That'll be the day. All right, watch this. <clears throat> okay, people, and now when I give you the cue, I want the 700-foot mountain of whipped cream to roll into Lake Michigan, which has been drained and filled with hot chocolate. Then the Royal Canadian Air Force will fly overhead towing a 10-ton maraschino cherry, which will be dropped into the whipped cream to the cheering of 25,000 extras. All right, cue the mountain. You the maraschino cherry. Okay, twenty-five thousand cheering extras. Now, you want to try that on television? Well... You see, radio is a very special medium because it stretches the imagination. Doesn't television stretch the imagination? Up to twenty-seven inches, yes. She was born in a humble shack amidst the lemon groves of Goleta, California. Mommy, don't cry. You know what they say? When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. I was going to say life sucks, and then you die. But I like yours better. And with that, Alexandra Johnson launched her lemonade stand. Lemonade, make a glass. Every day, even during the frigid California winters, a bone-chilling 72 degrees, you could find her. You never sour, you never tweet. Little girl's lemonade will knock you off your feet. The little girl with the sour brew wanted more. National distribution franchises, and so she rolled out a well-budgeted advertising campaign. Me and the rest of the dock workers only drink a little girl lemonade. She was made president of the International Sour Drink Association and chosen to give the keynote speech at their convention. You all sat with words of wisdom, honey? You know what they say, Mommy. Always advertise so consumers think of your product first? I was going to say never swallow a lemon seed or a watermelon to on your tummy. This fabricated but interesting story is to remind you that it's called advertising and it works. Put your message on this national advertising platform by emailing classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Now part two of the five-part yours truly Johnny Dollar story, the indestructible Mike Matter with uh, Howard McNear as Mike. This episode, June 5th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. John, this message I found when I came in. Yeah, Pete, somebody took a couple of shots at your $50,000 client, Mike Flynn. Well, is he... will he die? From the looks of things last night, he may pull through in spite of the two slugs in him. I hope so. Do you know who did it? No idea, but I'm going to try to talk to him. Have you talked to the beneficiary? Not yet. First, I want whatever information I can get from Mike, if he's still alive. Tonight... And every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location New York, New York. Attention, Peter Branson, Lakeside Life and Casualty Insurance Company. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the indestructible Mike matter. (laughs) Expense account item six, 55 cents. Taxi to the neighborhood of the Glad Hand Rescue Mission, where Daddy Bill, a general factotum, had promised to take the best of care of Michael Jeremiah Flynn. He'd given Mike a room to himself on the second floor, and what a room. What wallpaper was left hung in shreds from the cracked plaster. The shades on the dirty windows were tattered and torn. A single bare fly speck light bulb hung on a cord from the ceiling. The floor was bare, and the only furniture was a battered chest of drawers, an ancient washstand with a cracked pitcher and bowl, and a sagging iron bed on which old Mike Flynn lay. Come in. Come in there. Hi. Well, you must be the man who helped me into the mission last night. Yeah, yeah. My name's Johnny Dollar. Come up to see how you're making out. Well, I'm much obliged to you, Johnny. I'm real obliged to you. Well... How are you feeling this morning? Me? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Never felt better. <laughs> sit down. Sit down. 
Well, what did the doctor that Daddy Bill got for you have to say? The doctor for me? Oh, now, Johnny, you must be joking. <laughs> joking? After you had a couple of slugs tear through you? Here, let me help you. Oh, you want to see them? Sure, sure. Now, wait a minute. Now, just look for yourself here. Ah, you see? See? They just went through my side here, in the front, and out the back. Holy. Oh, see, aren't they heating up nicely? Well, that one couldn't have missed your heart by more than three inches. But it did. <laughs> yes, it did. Not nearly so close as this scar, though. What? Want to see this scar? Look at it right here. Hey, was that a bullet wound, too? No, no, oh, no, Johnny. That was just an old ice pick or something. Huh? Somebody in the crowd during that fire down at the battery line. Oh, wasn't that a beautiful fire, Johnny? Did you see that? Oh, but what did these slugs do to you inside? Oh, you must be... To me? Oh, not a thing. Well, I'm so durable. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you say there was another attempt on your life last week? No, 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 of course not. Just an accident like those shots last night. You think that was an accident? <clears throat> hmm? Why, don't you? Do you know who fired them? Oh, Johnny, I haven't the least idea. Well, no. Where did it happen? I was right here in the mission, and I didn't hear any shots. Oh, dear, no. I was down near my private place. Where's that? <sighs> Where's that, Mike? Well, I'll tell you, Johnny. It's this way. Daddy Bill and the others here at the mission are real nice to me. Oh, they're real nice. You can see by this lovely private room that they fixed up for me. <laughs> uh, yeah. And they'd like for me to stay here all the time. I guess Daddy Bill thinks if I'm here most of the time, I might not drink so much and keep getting into those kind of... Oh, say, do you ever enjoy a little drink, Johnny? Well, on occasion. But you were going to tell yes, me... Here. Oh, here. Now, I've got a little bottle tucked under the mattress here, Sam. Ah! Ah, here it is. <laughs> oh, what under the sun is that? That 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 color, that pink. Yes, that's my favorite. That pink, straight whiskey costs so much. Even when I have the money now and then. you know something, I like a little bit more kick in mine. I guess it's kind of a hangover from prohibition days. <laughs> so I mix a little kick into it. Here, Johnny, I want you to try this. Well, I uh, that yeah, go pink ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, you like this? Oh, oh, what a wallop! Well. <laughs> <laughs> what the sap, Ellen? Yes, what that sterno. Oh. That's what I add to it, just a little <laughs> bit of sterno. <laughs> Mike, this stuff will kill you. Oh, I've been drinking that for years. Look at me, the picture of health. Oh, mm, Mike, just take a little to me. Sip. Mm. I'm going to get ah. you a doctor. <laughs> no, no, you're not. I won't stand for it. But you've been shot. Oh, no. Just gave me a little twinge or two last night, but now I feel fine. Well, you fell flat on your face when you came in here. Oh, now listen, Johnny. Don't you tell Daddy Bill, but I'm afraid it wasn't the bullets last night. It was uh, <laughs> overindulgence. Oh, brother, I give up. <laughs> no, no, don't say that, Johnny. Oh, all right, then how did it happen? Well, I was on my way back here when the car drove by. Oh? It sounded to me like a couple of backfires or two, but <laughs> then I felt this little uh, sting on my side. And that's it. And you call that an accident? Well, of course. The men in the car were probably just having a little friendly argument. How many men? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. I think there were only two of them. I waved at them. What kind of a car? Black. Well, what make could you tell? Well, it was shiny and it was new. See, I wish I had a car, Johnny. Well, look, Mike, I'm on a level with you. Oh? I'm an insurance investigator. Insurance? Well, my... Well, say, that's interesting, Johnny. Say, let's have a little drink on that while you tell me No, that, no, you? no, thanks. <clears throat> and there isn't much to tell, except that I'm here to try to save your life, among other things. Well, no, I don't understand. I'm getting along all right. I, I've been living it up here in the Bowery for years. Maybe you were getting along okay until you took out that big insurance policy. Yeah, oh, say, wasn't that nice of Mr. Cosgrave? Now, all my life, I wanted to have some life insurance. You know, it gives you a kind of feeling of importance and security. So when he came down here one night and I told him that... Why, well, say, his eyes just lit up and he said he was going to make me a present of some insurance. Who is this Cosgrave? How much do you know about him? Oh, oh he's wealthy. I know that much about him. He has a beautiful car and a chauffeur. Does he come down here often? Oh, now and then. Just now and then. Why? Uh, uh, now, I've often wondered about that, Johnny. So one time I asked Daddy Bill, and he said that years ago when Mr. Cosgrave was young, he came to the mission for help, and Daddy Bill gave it to him. Well, what does he do when he's here? Oh, he brings some food for the brothers. Uh, the brothers, that's what Daddy Bill calls us. And some money, and he always gives jobs to a couple of men who've drifted in here. What kind of jobs, Mike? You know, that's something I don't know. You see, they never come back here again. Maybe it's because they can't. What's that? Uh, what'd you say, Johnny? Mike, I'm going to give it to you straight. 
To me, the whole thing smells to high heaven. To me, this Cosgrave sounds like a racketeer. Oh, no, I may no, be no. wrong. I'll know better when I meet him. And I intend to do that as soon as possible. But right this minute, I bet that he comes down here for only one purpose. To recruit help for some sort of illegal job. Oh, that's a terrible thought, Jim. When he heard you say you'd like insurance, he jumped at the chance. And why not? Let you name him as beneficiary and then have you knocked off. Oh, no, Jack. That ice pick in your side was no accident, Mike. No more than the shots at you last night. But he's been so nice. Sure, of course he has. He can afford to. After all, your body's worth $50,000 to him. And that's what you're going to be, Mike, just a body. Unless I can do something about oh, it. Oh, such a nice man, too. Really. How has he been getting this money to you? Yeah, well, oh, oh, in an envelope. By mail? Usually it's just left here at the mission. By whom? Well, nobody ever seems to know. It's just a plain envelope. It's dropped in the mail. No it's return like, address? No, 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 no. But I'm sure it comes, Mr. Cosgrave. Uh, say, come to think about it. Say, there was one due yesterday. Every Monday, you know. But Daddy Bill said it didn't arrive. Well, maybe it'll be here today. And you know something? I'd like to see it delivered. <laughs> no, you and I. You can't kid me, Johnny. You'd like to see who delivers it. <laughs> oh, say, why don't we go downstairs and wait and see? No, easy there, Mike. You're a sick man. <laughs> oh, you can't... stop talking that way, sick. Up we go. Oh, no, you can't. Oh, all it, right. It, it, it. Here, let me give you a hand. No, 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 no. I'm all right. I'm all right. Oh, say, look at that. Look at that. Daddy Bill left my shoes here by the bed. Oh, Brother, now I've seen everything. I put my shoe in everything. Ah, there. Now, there we are, all dressed. I don't know how you do it, Mike. Uh, uh, uh. Shall we go downstairs? Sure. Lead the way. All right, there. Well, the envelope should be there, because it always comes in the morning when there's nobody here. <laughs> you know, when Daddy Bill's out shopping and... Just the door to the assembly room is open for any poor lost soul who wants to come in, wait for the chow line to open. Well, we'll see. We'll see. And then we'll go to my private place. <laughs> you see, there are two things I like, Johnny. Yeah. Solitude and crowds of people. <laughs> oh, look at there, Johnny. Look at there. <laughs> There's mail there by the door. <laughs> You see? Ah, here's my envelope. And my name's on it, too. Wait, Mike. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Ah, uh, uh, you see there, Johnny? A $20 bill. Whee! Let me have that envelope <laughs> for possible proof. Oh, yes, yes. Here you are, Johnny. Now we can go out, you and I, and we can have a real... Vi well, now, Johnny, look at that. A package for me, too. Hey, easy, Mike. Let me have that. No, 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 no. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> An infernal machine or something. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm thinking. <laughs> but you didn't hear it gurgle. <laughs> oh. Well, look at there, Johnny. Well, joyous be one for you and one for me. Easy, Mike. I want to carry this one in the wrapping paper. <laughs> oh, fingerprints, huh? That's right, Mike. I'm going to take you back upstairs and lock you in your room. Uh -huh. You are to stay there. Let nobody in, not even Daddy Bill, until I get back oh, here. But Do Johnny... what I say. And just remember that I'm trying to save your life. <laughs> Item 7, 270, cab fare uptown to the 18th Precinct Station. The lab boys took over three hours while Randy Singer and I talked about cases that we'd handled together in the past. I asked him to dig up whatever he could for me on John Wesley Cosgrave, the man named as beneficiary of Mike's insurance policy. This he promised to do with him. Finally, a slim, intelligent-looking lieutenant walked in and handed Randy a neatly typed report of the lab's findings in connection with the liquor bottle and envelope I'd given them. Hmm. Hmm. Well, oh, Randy? Nah, not much, I'm afraid, Johnny. Apparently, the only prints were those made by the old man and you. Proof that somebody's been pretty darn careful not to be identified. Yeah, that's what... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Seal on the bottle had been tampered with, so the lab boys opened it. That bottle contained enough wood alcohol to kill an army. Now, if that old boy drinks the way you Good say... Good Lord, Randy. See you later. Item 8, 10 bucks even. Taxi fare and tip back to the Glad Hand Rescue Mission. I don't know how the driver did it, but he skinned through practically every red light on the route. And I soundly cursed myself for having left Mike with the other bottle. The place was apparently still empty when I pounded up the stairs to the second floor in Mike's room. At least he kept his room locked as ordered. Mike! Mike! Mike, are you all right? Mike! He was stretched out on the old iron bed, his face drawn even whiter than the pillow on which his head rested. The half-empty bottle lay where he dropped it on the floor beside him. And I got a sob for the stupid, careless, unthinking way in which I... Ooh. Mike! Johnny, what a hangover this is going to be. Now, 
Now here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the would-be beneficiary of Indestructible Mike turns out to be a very interesting and dangerous man. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. He was drinking Sterno. Of course, it survived wood alcohol. June 5th, 1956. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. My webpage, classicradio.stream. Gives you all the information you need to stream our shows on demand. Learn more about classic radio collecting. Drop me a tip if you want to, or buy me a Dr. Pepper. I would love it. And you can also contact me there at Classic Radio. Stream. Thank this station. Support their advertisers. Tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.